Exactly. Yeah. First John chapter four this afternoon. Uh, this is, I I know several versions of it, and the words in this one are slightly different than what I learned. So there's. Oh, oh, it's with a different melody. I'm not sure if I've heard it with a different melody, but several of these songs are set to different melodies because they were uh, they were poems that then people took the poem and set it to music. So sometimes uh, you have that. Actually, I think there's in this hymnal, was it Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, that is like three melodies that it's recorded in that hymnal with same words, but three different melodies. Um, and actually last week we sang... Um, not God rest you, Mary, gentlemen. Um, what is it? No, there's another one. Um, oh, what'd you say? Good Christian men rejoice. That's the one we sang last week. Uh, yeah, I also, I've been doing through the month of December, a short devotional on Christmas hymns and their history. That one was from like the 1300s. They're not exactly sure when it was written. Didn't even have music when it started. It was just a poem. And they were using it really as a way to teach the message of Christmas, the story of Christ. When you think about this is before even Gutenberg's press. And so when you didn't have mass printing of Bibles, you know, how do you teach something? Well, teach it through song because we remember the words and we can go, you know, and share that with someone else and teach them the song and they teach someone the song. And so we spread the truth that way when you didn't have, I mean, you had the written word, but not like we do today. So inexpensively, we can go and buy a Bible and carry it with us and uh, all of that. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's different melodies for those different, uh, sometimes different verses are in the hymnal because many of those have, 10, 15, 16 verses to the song. Um, I think Good Christian Men Rejoice is one of those. It's like 15 or 20 verses, but no hymnal puts all 20 verses in there. You just you pick four or five, and, and that's what we sing. First John chapter 4 this afternoon, though. First John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse number 7 and read to the end of the chapter. And we're going to talk about love, but more specifically, Loving one another. First John chapter 4, starting with verse number 7. First John 4, verse 7, towards the end of the New Testament. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And I'll explain that word. I know it's not a common word necessarily to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us. Because he hath given us of his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. In this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him, because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We started at the very beginning of that section in 1 John 4, 7, 
Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. And as we get into the message today, talking about loving one another, that's kind of the first thing we have to know and understand and have in mind that God is love. In order for us to love others the way we're supposed to, we have to have God within us because true love comes from God. He, he is love, as it says in verse 8, God is love. But that also means if he is love, he is the source of all love. Uh, I use the illustration in our Bulgarian service today of, you know, getting water out of a well. You know, when you go to a well, right, it has it's a source of water. And if you, especially if you lived in a time where there wasn't indoor plumbing or that, whatever, you had to go to the well. And what would you do? You had to put the bucket down and draw it out. And that would be where you would get water. That's the source. If you wanted water, you had to go to the well. Because God is love and he is the source of love. If I'm going to love others, well, I've got to go to the source first, right? Like I've got to get the water from the source. I've got to get the love from the source. If I don't know God and I don't have a relationship with him, I won't be able to love others the way God intends for us to love others and to care for one, for one another. In verse number nine, we saw this also. In this was manifested. That means like shown forth, made known. Uh, if you ever do anything with shipping, uh, you just recently did some shipping, right? Ship some bags. Uh, and there's a manifest that accompanies the things you ship. Maybe for something small like that, they don't necessarily do that. But there's usually some sort of sticker, packaging, something that is slapped on the box or put on the bag. What does it have? It's documents that make a declaration of what's inside. It's known as a shipping manifest. It makes known what is in here, and sometimes they do a check, right? They'll open it and make sure what you said was in there is in there. And uh, I remember they did that with our container that we shipped with uh, portions of John and Romans here. They had a seal on it. They broke the seal open and made sure that it was filled with boxes like we said it was. The manifest said this is what's inside, right? It reveals it. It makes it known. And here the Bible says in this was manifested, so made known, shown forth. The love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. Not only is God the source of love, but God made that love known. He showed it forth. He manifested it through what? Through his actions. Right? When we talk about love, unfortunately, in especially in our modern world, many people think of love as some kind of feeling. You know, I... I feel warm inside or I get a tingle or something. You know, they have this idea of love as a feeling. But if we read through scripture, you'll find over and over again that love does something. It's, it's, it acts. It performs something. It, in one hand, on one side, we could say it is a feeling, but it's a feeling that motivates us to act. And we could say all day long that we have love, but if we don't act, you know, do we really love? And I, I've used that example before. If I just told my wife, I love you, I love you, I love you, but I never did anything for her, she, she would be right to doubt my love. Because it's easy to say it. It's different to live it. And while it's good to say Men here, take that in mind. It's good to say once in a while, your wife needs to hear that, I love you. If you only say it, but never do anything, right? You don't surprise her with flowers or, you know, it's Christmas time. You might want to think about a gift, you know, those, those kinds of things. Just trying extra help here, some counsel, right? We show our love by our action. And I've, I've used, again, this example before. Think about when you're in that relationship, the early days, the courting time, you're getting to know one another, right? We as men, especially in that time, uh, we're trying to win her heart. And what do we do? We do all kinds of stuff, right? Like crazy stuff. But then we get comfortable and that kind of fades. But 
really, why did we stop doing those things, right? Why, why did we even do those things to begin with? It was a, a way of trying to prove that I, I care for you, that I love you, that I, I, I want to be with you, I want to spend time with you, right? We show our love. And God here, being the source of love, he didn't just say, I have love. He proved it. He gave his only begotten son. The most famous verse in the Bible, at least I'm convinced it's the most famous verse in the Bible, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world, and because of that love, what did he do? He gave, not only gave, but he sacrificed, right? He gave of himself, he laid down his life for our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins. And here we see that he that uh, in this was manifested the love of God towards us in that uh, because that God sent his only begotten son in the world that we might live through him here in his love. This is verse 10 of 1 John 4. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. So he's repeating that idea, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I said I would explain that word. Because it's a, uh, it's just a, it's a big word, right? It's one of these college words, propitiation. It's a legal term. It comes out of law. And what it means is this. Propitiation is the act of appeasing. That is kind of settling an offended party. That's why I said it's a legal term. Appeasing the offended party. I know even appeasing isn't necessarily an easy word, but it, right, it means to satisfy whether it be a debt or an offense or a hurt or something, right? There is one party that has been offended and we are guilty of that offense, right? When, whenever you have a legal case, you have two parties. And generally there's the offender and the offended, the propitiation is the act that is done to satisfy this offended party, basically taking away the offense. We can think of like a lawsuit in the world. It might be uh, this party over here who has offended the other party has to pay a fee. You know, maybe it's 10,000 euro. And that settles the offense right now. The guilt is gone. It's been paid over. That would be then that 10,000 euros would be a propitiation. It's the payment. It's the, the thing It's not always payment, right? But it's it's the act. It's whatever it is that it takes to clear the offense so that this offended party is no longer upset with the other party. Now. The Bible talks about one day, every one of us having to stand in judgment before God. So you think about judgment, the Bible refers to his seat of judgment, like a judgment hall. That's a legal proceeding, right? You don't stand, you don't go to the court and stand before a judge if it's not a legal proceeding. That means it's a legal proceeding. And what God is saying here is God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So what, what do we have here? Well, we really have a legal case. We have God who is the judge and who has been offended. What offended him? Our sins. And there was no way for us to cover that debt. You know, I use the example of somebody giving 10,000 euros to settle an offense, but we couldn't pay to settle our offense. 10,000 euros wouldn't cover it. A million euros wouldn't cover it. A billion euros wouldn't cover the offense that we have shown towards God. The only thing that would satisfy it was death because the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 says very clearly, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That offense that's here in the middle between us and God is our sin. And the penalty for sin is death. 
In order for God to be appeased, then someone had to die. We can choose to pay for our own sins, which is eternal death and separation and hell. But God, because he loved us, proved his love to us by sending his son to pay that price, to be that propitiation, the payment that settles the debt so that this party that was once offended is no longer offended. So that that sin is covered over. That's the love that God has to us. Now, something that's important to keep in mind with that is that love that God shows is unconditional. Right? We, we don't earn that love from him. He showed it to us when we didn't deserve it. Right? That's what we see in verse 10. Here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. So we love him because he first loved us. Is another way that it's said here in 1 John what does that mean? That means that when we were still God's enemy, when we were distant from him, when we had offended him, God said, but I still love you and I'm going to prove that I love you. And so he showed his love to us when we weren't worthy of his love, when we didn't deserve his love. In Romans chapter five, if you keep your finger here, because we'll come back. Romans chapter five, we see that so clearly. And I, I love this, this portion of scripture, Romans chapter five. Verse 8 is another one of those famous verses in the book of Romans chapter 5. So you have the four Gospels, then Acts, and then the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, we'll start at verse 6. I said verse 8 is a wonderful verse, but let's start with verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So there we see that propitiation again, Christ dying for the ungodly. We were yet without strength. In other words, this verse says we were ungodly. We, we couldn't have done it. We were hopeless, but Christ died for us then. In verse seven, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's that unconditional love of God. He wasn't waiting for us to become worthy, to do enough good and then say, okay, now mankind has bettered himself. Now I'll send my son to save him. No, it's, it's the exact opposite. When we couldn't save ourselves, when it was a lost cause, it was hopeless, Christ came and died for us. That's, that's why I love verse eight, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you put that together with verse 7, to me it makes verse 8 even that much more powerful. Because verse 7, when you read it, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Just kind of unpack that for a minute. What does that mean? Well, we might be willing to lay down our life for a, a, a good person, for a friend, right? To give... Some people will do this, right? I'm going to give my life for my country or for my friends. Uh, a good example of this relationship of parents and children, right? A good parent really is willing to die for their child, right? If, if that's going to mean my child survives, I will give my life for them. We, we understand it. No, those are extreme circumstances. But that's what verse 7 is talking about. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Right? There are cases where, where we would be willing to do that. But notice then when you look at the contrast, verse 8 starts right with that word, but. But, so there's a change here, there's a contrast. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So just think of it this way. We understand that there are some cases maybe a father for a child, you know, family members, good friends or something where someone would sacrifice themselves for another. But the contrast that God sets up here would be as if, or asking the question really, who would die for their enemy? It's one thing to lay down your life for your child. And we understand that. I'm not saying that's an easy thing or even an easy decision, but still, 
Right? That happens, and, and people will do that. But who does that for their enemy? Right? Even if you're not talking about laying down a life. Uh, last year when my father was sick and you know there was a, at the time maybe a chance that with a liver transplant uh, he could survive. And uh, I was talking to the doctors if I would be able to be a living donor for my father. And I mean, it's a pretty serious procedure to, to donate from a living liver and all, but there's ways to do all that. And we were looking into it, if that would spare my father's life, if that meant I'd had to be in the hospital for a month afterwards, that's okay. I, I, I would do that. He's my dad. I love him. Uh, my enemy? Right? I, I, well, you're not giving your life. Yeah, but I'm not going to give a month of my life. Right? That, that would be a tough decision to say, this man who hates me, I'm going to give my life for him. But that's exactly what God did. God said, even though you hate me, I'm going to show you the extent of my love. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for, died for us. See, love is a choice. Now, look, when we talk about relationships, right, when we show love to someone else, it does make it easier for them to love us, right? We, you know, we should, again, using a marriage relationship, hey, let's try to make it easy to love one another, right? But love is still a choice. I, I choose to love someone. So that means God made the choice. He, he chose to love us when we were unlovable. And he did that unconditionally because he loved the world. Having all that in mind, what did John tell us in 1 John then? He said, because God loved us, then we should love others. But notice the context of it is him talking about God's unconditional love toward us when we were sinners, when we were wicked, when we were his enemies, the Bible says, when we railed against him, right? We, we fought against God. In that state, God loved us and gave himself. And John says, because God did that for us, we should do that for others. What does that mean? That means we have to make that choice. Now, remember, we started with God is the source of love. If God isn't in us, if we don't have his strength, there's no way for us to do that. There's no way for us to love our enemies, to do good who, to those who fight against us without God's help, without his love within us. But that's what God is calling us to do. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, that's going to be the sign that we're even his disciples. In other words, as we love others, we show the world that we belong to God. Because we can't do it without his help. In John chapter 13, so the gospel of John, back towards the beginning of the New Testament, Jesus commanded us, to love one another. In John chapter 13, verse 34, John 13, verse number 34, Jesus says this to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Keep your finger there. I, I want to just read quickly to get it back in our minds what it says in 1 John 4.12. Because I'm going to read that and then we'll read this passage in John 14 again. But 1 John 4.12. I thought I'd do it quickly, but my fingers aren't turning fast. John said there, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. Now think about this in John 13. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Let's, let's kind of put those two things together. No man has seen God at any time. We, we know that to be true. Right? God was manifested in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. But no man has seen God in all of his glory. Even Moses... 
We have the story where Moses says, talking with God face to face, but says, God, I want to see you. And God said, you can't, you'll die. I'll let my glory pass before you. I'll hide you over here. I'm going to put my hand over you and you'll catch a glimpse of my glory as I pass by. And even that was so much that Moses had to keep his face covered when he talked to other people afterwards because of the after effect of that glory. So no one has seen God in all of his glory. How many people, even that we meet on the street, say, well, I'd believe in God if he would show himself. Well, I mean, Jesus did come to earth and people still rejected him. So I think the statement they're making is untrue. But still, people say that if I could see God, you know, if he would reveal himself, if he would write something in the sky, if he would do that, then I would believe. No man has seen God at any time. But John continues there saying, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us. The two phrases are tied together. See, no one has seen God, but when we love one another and we show love to others and we make that choice to love those who are even our enemies, what do we do? We show Christ to the world. We show God to the world. So while they may not see God, they should be able to see him through us. His love working through us. Showing love to others. Having love one to another. As Jesus said, this is going to be the sign. People will know that you're my disciple. And think about that. The world does know that. The world knows that God is love. That idea. Even atheists or people who claim to be atheists who don't know the Bible. At the same time, they have this idea that God is love. And they'll say things like that. You know, well, I mean, I can't believe in God. I had somebody say this to me just a couple weeks ago. I, I just can't believe in, uh, in, in that God because, you know, look at all these problems in the world. If he really was love, he would fix all these problems. So this, this person who was talking to me, claiming to kind of be an atheist, they don't really believe in God, yet had this idea that if there's a God, he would be loving. Where did that, where did that come from? That's, that's naturally within us. That's another topic to talk about, but that innate knowledge of God that we all are born with. But that man had this idea that the God of the Bible, because he knew that's what I was talking about, the God of this book, the almighty God, creator of the world, that man understood that that God is a loving God. Now, according to him, he wasn't seeing that love in the world. And one of the statements he made is, you know, throughout history, there have been all of these wars in God's name. And I told him, you're right, there have been. But that doesn't mean God approved of those. But, you know, just because someone said they did it in God's name doesn't mean it was in God's name. And how, how many people have, have done things like that? You know, said that they're not saying just acting in God's name, right? They, they've said they're acting on someone else's behalf, but that's not really what the other person would want. Right. Or liars or deceivers. Uh, that's one of the big scams now. Right. People send an email saying they're from some government agency or this or that or some bank. And well, it doesn't mean that those people are really from that bank. They're just using the name of that bank. They're using that identity or falsifying. So as I talked with that man, I said, look, I, I understand what you're saying, but. You, you know, God isn't saying to do these things. But it was interesting to me. He had this knowledge that God should be loving and cares for people. And when someone doesn't do that, they that person, would, he was accusing God. But the reality was he was accusing those people for not acting like a Christian. And, and when you say that a Christian, people automatically have in mind some idea that, well, you're going to be honest. You're not going to try to cheat me. You're you're. Right? You're going to look out for me. This is all stuff that people understand about God. And as we love others, as we show Christ's love, we are an example to the world. They've not seen God, but at the same time, they're seeing God through us if we'll love one another. 
if, if we'll care for others, if we'll show God's love to others, if we'll follow this commandment. No man has seen God at any time. But if we have love one for another, they see him through us. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, so if you're still there in John, just back up a couple of books. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said it would be a sign, basically, right? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. In Matthew chapter 5, verse number 16, Jesus says there, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What works? That work of loving one another. It's a... It's a fruit of the Spirit. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, there is a list there given of the fruit of the Spirit. And the very first item in the fruit of the Spirit is love. It says, now, the fruit of the Spirit is this. Love, joy, peace, patience. The list continues on from there, but if you just think about a few of those, one, the very first one is love. That comes from God. He's the source. It's because of the Spirit of God in us. And if the Spirit of God is working in us, then we should have as a natural, you just think about like a seed, right? Seed brings forth a plant, tree or whatever, and that tree will produce fruit. That's the natural process. So that Holy Spirit within us, that seed will produce something as it grows. It produces fruit. And the very first fruit listed is love. It's, it's the first thing of Christ living within us that should come out of that. But you think through that list, it mentions patience. Without love, it is impossible to be patient with other people. Because that's not just patience of, okay, I'm willing to wait for something. No, when, when the Bible talks about that long suffering, that patience, it's the idea of, Interacting with others, right? Having mercy and patience and showing that to them. Mercy is another one of the fruits listed. Without love, there's no way to have mercy and to show mercy, right? It, God showed us mercy because of his love. God was patient with us because of his love. Right? In the book of 2 Peter, it's chapter 3, verse 9, that says, you know, God is not slack concerning his promise. And there it was talking about his promise to destroy the world, to judge the world. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, meaning that people are thinking, oh no, he made that promise, he's not going to fulfill it. And the reason they say that is, well, you know, Christians and the Bible, you know, you've all been preaching that the world is going to end for the past 2,000 years, and actually longer than that, because in the book of Jude, it quotes the prophet Enoch. And Enoch was the fifth from Adam, if I remember correctly in my genealogy, or seventh from Adam. Seventh, there you go. Uh, so just off the top of my head trying to remember, but really close to the beginning, right? And he preached about Christ coming back as a conquering king with thousands of his saints to judge the world. So if Enoch, 6,000 years ago, Preach that. So for 6,000 years, we've been preaching, God is going to judge sin. And some say, ah, God, I mean, you Christians have been saying that, look, the world just continues as it is. And that's exactly what Peter said. God is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish that all should come to repentance. What motivates God's long-suffering? His patience with us? His mercy to us? It's His love. So that fruit of the Spirit within us, it should be producing love for one another. It should be producing love even for others, even for our enemies. In uh, Luke, let me turn over there, I... I have the wrong reference written here. I know that. But I have it written here. So I just got to look it up. Luke chapter 6. Verse 
Verse number 27, Luke chapter 6, verse 27. It's the third of the Gospels. Jesus speaking here, but I say unto you, which here love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. So think about that, right? Here Christ is giving this command, not just to love one another, but he says, love your enemies. Which God did that, right? Even on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He, he's on the cross dying because of those men. And he says, forgive them. And we have an example that we're able to do that too through God's strength. If you just skip ahead from that story in the Gospels to the book of Acts chapter 7, where they stone Stephen to death for preaching the Gospel. And Stephen looks up into heaven and he says, forgive them. We're supposed to love our enemies. But notice there in verse 32, if ye love them that love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. So what is that? It's easy to love somebody who's already shown love to me. Right? Okay, you've been nice to me. I can be nice back. But Jesus said, no, no. If you do that, I mean, what? That's no different than what the world does. The world loves those that love them. But you're to be different. You're to love them that hate you. Verse 33, and if ye do good to them, which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies. That's the second time in just this short passage he said that. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. What did Jesus command in John 13? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. He have loved one for another. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 11. As Christ loved us, we should love the world. And here Jesus says again, love your enemies. Be kind to them. Pray for them who despitefully use you. I want to look at, we'll close with this. Psalm chapter 35. Slightly different from the notes I sent you, Ray. Sorry. Psalm chapter 35. It's the Psalm of David, and we'll start at verse 9, because here's a great example of someone doing exactly what we're talking about. My soul shall be joyful. This is Psalm 35, verse 9. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. And if you know the story of David's life, those kind of things happened to him. Verse 12, they rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, who's the they? The false witnesses, the ones who rewarded him evil for good. To the spoiling of his soul. That doesn't mean that made his soul rotten. It means taking away from. It's like thievery, stealing from. So these who were false witnesses, who rewarded him evil, who stole from him. As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, which was a sign of, in the sense, this contrition of I'm going to pray for them. I'm, I'm broken for them. I'm seeking God's face. I'm going to make myself uncomfortable on their behalf. 
my clothing with sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother, right? Again, what did Jesus say? If we show love to those who love us, I mean, that's normal, right? If we're good to those who are good to us, I mean, the lost world does that. And David here is saying, these who were false witnesses, these who rewarded me evil for good, when they were sick, I behaved as if he was my friend or brother. Right? I treated him no different than that, even though he was my enemy. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. That's the love that God has to us. And that's the love God's commanding us to have towards others. And this is a good example of what that love looks like. He may be my enemy, but I'm going to pray for him. Right? Jesus said the same thing in Luke chapter 6. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Which is stronger than just using you, right? Nobody likes to be used. Somebody to just take advantage of us. And he says, despitefully use you. They're, they're kind of angry about how they take advantage of you. They, they, don't, they don't even give you the false thank you as they take advantage of you. They, they just walk all over you. And Jesus says, pray for them. Love them. Care for them. As David did here. As if it was my brother or as if it was my mother. That's the love we're to have to one another. I have one more place back in 1 John. I, I do want to close with that last verse there. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 21. And we'll just end with this verse. And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. That he who loveth God Love his brother also. May we all be faithful to love one another. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this afternoon and or for the privilege we've had now today to uh, open your word, to spend at least a short amount of time away from the world, praising you, looking at and studying about your love, Lord, looking into what your word says. Help us now, Lord, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, to be faithful servants on, uh, for you in this world. Lord, guide us. Help us to love one another. Help us to love those that are around us, Lord, to show your love to the world, to be a light in this dark place. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.